And so Jerusalem is not the kingdom of Jesus. It's just not. Now, he is the king of Jerusalem in the same sense that he is the king of every other nation on the planet, because he is the king of all. But he is not specifically the king of Jerusalem. And so because of that, Christians really have absolutely no reason to look at the Scripture and believe that it obligates them to side with Israel. Except in one way. Hey fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for The Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Today's Chaplain Report is going to be a little bit different because I typically, even when I do integrate politics with The Chaplain's Report and talk about a political issue and, and describe how the Bible speaks to that, I do it in a less direct way. This one, I'm just going straight for the politics. And the reason for that is because this is something that is timely that the Bible actually does have something to say about. And it's primarily because I see a lot of Christians in error. And I'm doing this lovingly and, and just wanting to correct a mistake. But it is an error. And I think it's one that does need to be pointed out. So bringing this up, I want you to know before we sort of depart on this journey, I want you to know up front, I support Israel. I think Israel has a right to defend itself when any country, regardless of who they are, launches a whole bunch of rockets on a populated city trying to indiscriminately kill people. Then yes, you absolutely have a right to deploy rockets to defend yourself and to take out the people trying to kill you. That is part of self-defense. So I do support Israel, and I think that they're in the right. I think there's no moral equivalency between them and the Palestinians whatsoever. A lot of people have tried to point out, yeah, well, the, the uh, Israel's government tried to evict a bunch of Palestinians. Okay, that's a much more complicated case than they're giving it credit for. The Supreme Court there in Israel has been going back and forth on this for a while now. This is a literally a decades-old case that they're trying to sort of sort out. But, okay, let's say that they did having a couple of families evicted from their houses may or may not be wrong, but it's certainly not worth firing thousands of rockets into a, a populated area of people that had nothing to do with that. And so there, there's an issue drawing some moral equivalency there. However, the error that I told you about that I think a lot of Christians find themselves in is they try to make the case that they are supporting Israel because of their religious affiliation, that because I'm a Christian, I'm obligated to defend Israel. That's incorrect. I'm sorry, but it's, just, it's simply not correct. Now, again, I think Israel's right on this, but not because they're Israel. I think they're right because they're doing the right thing. And so there are a few verses that I'd like to bring to your attention to think about this, because the thing that is important to understand about the New Testament is that Christians do not have a special allegiance to Israel anymore. We do come out of the same Judeo-Christian tradition, and there are some similarities that come from that, but we don't have any special allegiance to Israel as a nation or as a people. I mean, the book of Galatians talks about how there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, for all are one in Christ Jesus. The only thing that we're concerned about is, are you in the kingdom or are you not in the kingdom? We shouldn't be making decisions based on whether or not you know, we should side with Israel because they're Israel. Israel was a very important place, and they are the keepers of the covenant of Moses back in the day. They're not now. They no longer have a special relationship with God. And this is something that the scripture points to over and over again. We'll look first at John 4, verses 21 through 23, which says, Jesus said unto her, talking to the woman at the well here, Believe me, woman that a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. 
You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, because salvation is from the Jews. But a time is coming, and even now has arrived, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. All right, now I want you to think about this and, and concentrate on this. Jesus is talking to a woman who is asking him a question about where it is correct to worship. And Jesus is saying, okay, under the old law, yeah, Jerusalem, salvation is from the Jews. But a time is coming and has arrived. He's talking about the kingdom that he is about to establish. A time is coming where you will not worship on this mountain or that mountain, but in spirit and in truth. And so this is an important distinction that Jesus is bringing up. He's saying, there was a time where it was very important that you worship in Jerusalem, but that's going away now. The only thing that's going to matter is, because God is a spirit, that you are worshiping him in spirit and in truth. The location is not important anymore. So Jerusalem, as a location, is not significant to the Christian. It is completely irrelevant. Jesus points this out very emphatically in John chapter 4. Now, Let's look at the covenant as well. And this one comes from Hebrews 8, 10 through 13, where he says, For this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they will not teach each one his fellow citizen and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful toward their wrongdoings, and their sins I will no longer remember. When he said, A new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is about to disappear. So this is really important because Hebrews is kind of the link between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It, it sets up this dichotomy of the old law and the new law and shows how the new law is not an abolishment of the old law, but it is bringing it to full fruition. But an important thing to note in this verse is it says that the old one is obsolete because the new one was the fulfillment of the old, which means the old one is no longer in effect. He's saying, you know, the, the old law had flaws, and it was not perfect in the sense that it did not have the ability to save because it didn't have the human sacrifice of God coming to man and being sacrificed and having his blood forgive the forgive uh, his blood to wash away the sins and forgive his followers. The new covenant does, and the new one is better. Therefore, the old one is put away. It is obsolete. It is no longer in effect because God has made a new deal with his people. And every time that God makes a new covenant with his people, the old one goes away. And you can see this throughout the scripture. This is not the only time where God renegotiates his deal with humanity. It happens with Abraham. And it happens with Adam. It happens with Noah. And then when he finally gets to Moses, when the giving of the law happens, he makes a covenant with Israel, if you will follow me, I will be your God, and I will take care of you, and I will bless you as a nation. Now, Israel didn't always live up to that, but the point is, that was the covenant that was made with them in Exodus and in Deuteronomy. But what this Hebrew writer is saying is that once the new covenant is established, the old one isn't in effect anymore. This was also true for the Noahic covenant when Abraham came around, and it was also true for the Abrahamic covenant when the old covenant, the law of Moses, was put into place. Once that happened, the Old Covenant, it's gone. It's obsolete. It's no longer in effect. And so because of that, we've already looked at how the location, the physical location of Jerusalem is not important to a Christian. Now we're seeing that the Old Covenant is also not important to a Christian. Now it may be important, important for what Paul described in Galatians as a tutor, for our understanding, for helping us to learn God's nature. But as far as actually being bound by it, the Hebrew writer is saying that's not a thing anymore. We have a new covenant, and we don't need the old one. And so, as both a, a nation and as the covenant that was made with God to Israel, those things are gone now. Jesus, when he's being questioned by Pilate, in John 18, 36, Jesus is saying, And Jesus answered, 
my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. The reason that this is so important to understand is because Jesus is making a declaration to Pilate here that my kingdom doesn't exist on this plane of existence. If it did, I would be a king, I would have armies. And that's how Pilate was thinking, because he was asking, well, are you a king? Are you really the king of the Jews? And Jesus responds, he says, I am a king, but my kingdom doesn't exist the way that you think about a kingdom. It's not that I'm the king of the Jews, because again, Pilate was kind of mocking him for the fact that his own people delivered him to him. He says, it's not that I'm the king of the Jews, it's that I'm the king of the kingdom of God. This is different. Now, Jesus was king of the Jews in a sense, because he is of the Jewish lineage. He is the fulfillment of the covenant that God made with David. He is a, a the ultimate fulfillment of the, the lineage of David. But he's not a physical king the way that David was, or Saul, or Solomon, or any of the other kings of Israel. He's a spiritual king of a spiritual kingdom. And that's why he says, my kingdom's not of this world. And so Jerusalem is not the kingdom of Jesus. It's just not. Now, he is the king of Jerusalem in the same sense that he is the king of every other nation on the planet, because he is the king of all. But he is not specifically the king of Jerusalem. And so because of that, Christians really have absolutely no reason to look at the Scripture and believe that it obligates them to side with Israel. Except in one way. The fact that, and this is kind of the reason that I support Israel, even though I don't have a religious reason to, I do have a religious reason to in this limited sense. I do believe that God obligates us to defend those who are doing what's right and to call out evil when we see it. Hamas is an evil terrorist organization that wants to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. Israel does have some animosity towards them, which is understandable. And I'm not saying Israel always does everything right. And if the roles were reversed and Israel was just killing random people for no reason, yeah, I would condemn Israel for doing that. And I have condemned Israel for doing things that I thought were sometimes a little bit heavy-handed, but it does not seem that they have done that at all in this conflict. I mean, if anything, I think they've been a little too restrained. I do have a moral obligation that does come from my faith to support those that are doing the right thing and are just trying to defend themselves. And in this case, that is Israel. So while I don't have a reason to support Israel because they are Israel, I do have an obligation to support Israel because they're right. Stay the course, friends. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow sun of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel, you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.